This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Stick around to find out how you can get 83% off and one month for free. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and this week has been quite eventful. We kicked off the start of the week with another Starlink launch that included a few unique mission elements. We also got some interesting new information about the terminals that will be used by Starlink consumers. Crew Dragon's in-flight abort test is coming very soon with some interesting mission elements that you may not know about. Then of course, the Starship development has been kicking along in Boca Chica with the build of a new test tank. Loads to talk about today, so let's get stuck into it. On Monday night, SpaceX launched their first mission for 2020. Another 60 Starlink satellites were sent up on this mission into low Earth orbit from Cape Canaveral. Now, SpaceX is going to be relying on Starlink as a pivotal component to their business in the next few years. And with this third launch, there are now around 180 Starlink satellites in orbit. Even with some of these being test satellites, this makes SpaceX the operator of the largest fleet of commercial satellites currently in operation. So this is a big deal already, right? And we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg here with over 20 more Starlink launches supposedly heading into orbit over the course of this year. The launch itself seemed very similar to the last Starlink launch, but there were quite a few interesting points to talk about here which are a little out of the ordinary. Firstly, there was one satellite in this batch which has an experimental darkening treatment applied. This is a test to see if SpaceX can help to limit the light reflecting off the flat panel surfaces, which has had the public a little concerned about the impact Starlink may have on the night sky. These stories have popped up everywhere since the first set of 60 satellites were launched. Now I think one factor that is not well understood is just how much more reflective the satellites are before they are placed into their final orbit. Starlink satellites are deployed at around 290 kilometers in altitude and they raise their orbit slowly with their onboard thrusters to get into their final positions at around 550 kilometers in altitude. Now while they are proceeding to their final orbits, the solar arrays are positioned in a low drag orientation to limit the impact of the tiny amount of atmosphere still present at this altitude. Even though this is a minuscule amount of drag, over time it can still have an effect on how long the satellites will be able to stay in orbit. When the solar arrays are in this configuration, they reflect a lot more light down to the surface. Not only that, but they can be spotted much easier when there's a condensed train of them flying overhead, as I'm sure many of you have seen via various shared clips on social platforms. When these satellites have just been deployed, there always seems to be a bunch of news coming out very critical of this network, or even more reports about UFO sightings and that sort of thing. So yes, it's good to see that SpaceX are experimenting with ways to help this issue. It is going to be interesting to know how that works out. Now, I had my fingers crossed for this mission that we'd see the retention rods holding the 60 Starlink satellites release because we haven't yet seen that shot on any of the three launches so far. Sadly again, like clockwork, the feed cut out just after the acquisition of Signal with Tasmania. I really want to see the way the satellites deploy, so fingers crossed we'll get to see this shot in the next launch. Now the current plan for Starlink's new global internet service is for it to kick off later this year covering areas of the northern United States and Canada. Elon did mention this week that there would likely need to be at least four other launches before this can happen. After the launches this year, the network should begin to expand to near global coverage of the populated world in 2021. Now, just think about this for a moment. We're talking high speed connections that will be available for aircraft, ships, military operations, you name it. Now every time I talk about Starlink, I get a load of comments saying that it won't be useful for much of the world because current fiber connections and current infrastructure is everywhere. But this really isn't that true. There will be a huge competition to ISPs that hold monopolies in regions all over the world. In many cases, users simply don't have a choice of ISP. As another example, in Australia here, there are fibre connections running right into the home. I'm lucky enough to be in one of these areas, but a huge percentage of Australia is limited to old copper connections in cases well under 24 megabits per second. So there's loads of room for improvement and plenty of market opportunity for Starlink to disrupt these industries, just like SpaceX and Tesla. By forcing competition, the ISPs will have to compete, and this is a good thing for everyone. Now some interesting information was tweeted out this week by Elon Musk about the end user terminals, which did surprise me a little. 
It was asked when we can hear more about the Starlink terminals, to which Elon replied saying that they will look like a thin, flat, round UFO on a stick, and the Starlink terminals have motors to self-adjust an optimal angle to view the sky. The instructions, he said, are very simple. Plug it in, point it at the sky, no training required. Now, I must admit, I had assumed the antenna would be more like a flat panel, so this was interesting. Again, of course, the first stage of the Falcon 9 nailed its landing on the drone ship, making this the 48th landing booster for SpaceX. That was the fourth flight and landing as well, with all of them being done on drone ships. It was the exact same booster that launched the first batch of 60 satellites as well, so this is its second Starlink flight. Sadly, Miss Tree didn't quite catch the elusive fairing again. It did come incredibly close with the parafoil, apparently getting snagged in the netting. Now, I've had a few queries this week asking why this was called Starlink 2 instead of Starlink 3, and this is essentially because the first batch of 60 was really just a test launch and deployment test. The last two flights have been largely production-ready batches. Now, if you would like to know a little bit more about Starlink, I have a more in-depth video from late last year. And while you're here, please do feel free to subscribe to the channel. There is so much more to share with you with Crew Dragon coming up and Starship development. Almost 100,000 subscribers now, which just blows my mind. Thank you everyone for the incredible support. Now, just before jumping onto the next topic, a shout out here to Reese Wilson, who created this amazing new render of Starlink satellites packed inside the Falcon 9 booster. Great work there, mate. I just love the incredible content that comes from fans in the community. Do follow Reese on Twitter or Instagram. I've got links to this in the description. Over to Boca Chica for some Starship updates, and again, a huge thank you to Boca Chica Gal and NASA Spaceflight for capturing some great shots of Starship development news this week. One of the most interesting parts to watch was the construction and the mating of the bulkheads forming this test tank. As far as I know, this is the first tank test component using the newly improved construction and welding techniques. What we see here are two bulkhead components, both joined to a separate ring segment. Of course, this new test tank has been transported to the launch site along with the retired Starhopper. Some nice footage here, both by Boca Chica Gal and Boca Chica Maria of the transport taking place. Now, the idea here was to see how much pressure this tank could take before rupturing. Thanks also to Lab Padre who captured the rupture point on his live stream. Very interesting to see that footage as well. Elon later tweeted here saying that the pressure test made it to 7.1 bar. Now this is great news as around 6 bar is needed for orbital flight. He also said that the more precise parts and better welding conditions should reach around 8.5 bar of pressure, which would meet the safety factor for a crewed flight. So yes, test successful. I'm assuming this means that the next bulkheads will be appearing for stacking very soon. Elon Musk of course recently tweeted that he believes the new and improved SN1 Starship prototype could be ready for its test flight in two or three months. So perhaps around March we'll be seeing a very complete Starship fully stacked again ready for the flight. Need to keep in mind of course here that we're talking Elon time which can be a little optimistic. I suspect it's probably going to be a little further away than this but during the week we have seen some quite rapid progress of the new test tank so who knows. Now John Winkup from Florida here snapped a few photos showing a new shipment of parts being loaded up from Florida on the ship Go Discovery. Sadly of course the existing Cocoa facility still has a huge amount of Starship hardware which largely seems destined for scrapyards. Some of the structures at the site at least are still proving useful and this new shipment heading to Boca Chica includes a base structure for a Starship component to be mounted as well as some other parts. Now, Crew Dragon's in-flight abort test is one of the final major tests for SpaceX before NASA will have astronauts fly aboard the spacecraft early this year. Originally, we were running under the assumption that this test flight would be happening this weekend, but earlier this week, it was announced that NASA and SpaceX are now targeting no earlier than Saturday, January the 18th for the in-flight abort test, assuming all goes to plan. NASA said that the reason for this was to allow additional time for spacecraft processing. Now, SpaceX will launch the Crew Dragon capsule from Launch Complex 39A from Kennedy Space Center on a fully fueled Falcon 9 rocket. During the launch, the rocket punches through a point of maximum dynamic pressure where the forces on the rocket are at their highest during the launch. At this point, around 90 seconds in, the abort test will kick in by 
are terminating engine thrust. This is then going to prompt the Crew Dragon and Trunk to separate away from the second stage by igniting eight Super Draco engines which will pull the capsule away from the launch vehicle at a higher velocity than the booster is capable of. After the shutdown of the Super Dracos, the Crew Dragon capsule will then coast along to its highest altitude and then separate from the trunk. After this, the capsule will deploy parachutes at the correct time and land in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, because of this test, it requires a booster to be completely sacrificed in this mission. The booster has already flown three other times in May, August and December of 2018, so it's been stored away for a while now. And it's also the very first Block 5 booster designated B1046. Now, I'm kind of surprised they're actually sacrificing the first one. I think I always expected this to fly a bunch more times and be retired in a museum somewhere. Now I think it's also worth mentioning that all three booster landings were on drone ships as well, so this one has had a tough life so far. Because it's not going to be landing, we'll be seeing it on the pad without legs, grid fins or the TTEB engine ignition fluid. Now, because the abort sequence will be fired before the second stage separates, the second stage will actually be flying without a single Merlin vacuum engine. The second stage is still expected to be fully fueled just to simulate a close weight to a real second stage. So yes, it's going to be interesting to see if the booster will rapidly explode right after the Crew Dragon escapes off the top. That is going to be an awesome launch to watch. Now what do you think? Will the booster explode immediately after the abort or do you think it will defy all odds and stay together? Let me know in the comments. Now over the last few weeks my video publish times have been slightly out of the ordinary. I've actually been on holiday so was just missing the regular time slots and ending up roughly a day or so late so thanks for your patience there. Luckily, while on holiday, I was still able to work on my content without too much interruption from public Wi-Fi access, so it was all good. In these situations, I always use a VPN to help protect myself, and of course, that's where my sponsor Surfshark VPN can help you. A VPN, or virtual private network, is a privacy protection tool that guarantees instant online safety. Surfshark encrypts all the data sent via the internet so that no one can see your passwords, photos, videos, sensitive data, or know what you're doing online. Now, there's loads of reasons you may not want network administrators and internet service providers to track what sites you're viewing. Just one example could be if you have very differing personal views or beliefs from those around you. You can even change which country you're accessing the internet from to access and unblock content. This is super helpful if you want to view content that is restricted geographically, especially social platforms, external news sites, and of course, entertainment. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe the internet should be an open hub of knowledge. And with Surfshark, you can access content from anywhere, and they're the only VPN to offer one account to use on an unlimited number of devices. Devices. If you would like to give it a try and also support my channel, go to surfshark.deals/marcus and you'll get 83% off plus one month for free. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, there's no risk in trying it out for yourself. The link is in the description below. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do take a second and hit that like button. A huge thank you to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and you would like to be a part of this, follow my Discord or Twitter link in the description and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my compilation video talking about the most amazing achievements from the space industry in 2019. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTuber selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.